hello everyone and welcome to Technologies, Strategies and Method Methodologies of Promising Explorers hosted by SIX. I'm pleased to introduce our speakers for today. We have Francis McDonald, President of Canorland Minerals, David D'Onofrio, CEO and Director of White Gold Corp, Neil Briggs, Director of Playfair Mining, and Brian Skanderbeg, President, CEO and Director of GFG Resources. Before we begin, I want to remind you all that you can submit your questions at any time on the Q&A panel on the right hand side of the screen, and we'll make sure to get to them after the discussion. And as always, this event is being recorded and will be available to watch afterwards on six.com. But before we begin, just to kick us off, um, if each of you could just introduce yourself and your company, starting with you, Francis. Uh, my name is Francis McDonald. I'm president of Kenorland Minerals. And Kenorland is an exploration company, and we're really focused on, on green fields exploration opportunities. We have a number of projects that we are sole funding and exploring ourselves. And then we have a number of projects that we've partnered out uh, with companies like Sumitomo, Newmont, Barrick, mm -hmm. and Centera currently. And we have a large exploration portfolio with about six or 700,000 hectares of ground. Um, and we are progressing all of that in the next year. Thank you, uh, David. Nice to be here. Thank you. Uh, CEO and uh, part of the co-founding group of uh, White Gold Corp. We have a very large uh, and pretty unique portfolio of properties up in uh, Canada's Yukon. Uh, focused in what's known as the White Gold District, also the Klondike. And this was the epicenter of the infamous gold rush from uh, 120 years ago. And uh, what we've been able to do uh, you know, over the last several years is basically uh, compile uh, the majority of the claims in the district. We're now the largest uh, landholder there and uh, put together a, a very unique package that uh, we've partnered with Technico, Eagle and Kinross uh, to help us continue to explore. And it's a, it's an interesting situation as you had this prolific district with all this rich placer mining that's been happening over the last 100 years, uh, producing over 20 million ounces of gold, but nobody really had gone there to do any modern day exploration until Sean Ryan uh, went there with a thesis that, uh, you know, with this much gold on surface, there's got to be more. It was a tricky place to explore and you know, a lot of this... Um, innovation that we're going to speak about i think it plays a part to why we exist today and he was remarkably successful uh, right away in, in making multiple uh, large multi-million ounce discoveries taken up by majors and uh, you know we've now partnered with sean and uh, this other company that we met to continue to uh, work there you know we have a nearly a uh, couple million ounce deposit and uh, this huge blue sky portfolio that we're uh, deploying some of these methodologies on currently Great. Well, I'm excited to learn more. Welcome. And Neil? Yeah, my name is Neil Briggs. I'm a director of Playfair Mining. We're currently focused on an old copper mining district in south central Norway, about 100 kilometers south of Trondheim. Um, been a copper producer for on and off for 400 years but hasn't had much recent exploration, has a lot of data. We've got what we think is a, a novel way of looking at the old data and focusing down out of the many, many targets that are available on the property to the ones we think are the best. And we're in the midst of a drilling program, which we started last fall, and we'll be picking up again in the next few months as the weather comes in. Uh, additionally, Playfair, mm -hmm. I should point out, Playfair has a, a tungsten deposit on the south coast of Newfoundland. Great, thank you so much. And Brian. Thanks, Dasha. Uh, Brian Skanderbeg, I'm the president and CEO of TFG Resources, and we're a district scale exploration vehicle. We're focused on two core assets. Um, one of them is a portfolio of, of early stage um, properties in the Greater Timmins Belt. The other one's a uh, alkaline gold district in central Wyoming, where we're partnered with uh, a private company called D11, which is attempting to bring in situ mining to gold. So I think we're a vehicle that looks to apply unique technology to uh, the assets we control. Some of them at uh, an exploration stage, and other ones that are more on development stage. So. Um, 
<clears throat> very much in terms of our capital and I think in terms of the dialogue today, we're most focused on the Timmins portfolio where we're uh, holding three main land positions um, both east and west of Timmins and the goal this year would be advanced materially at Montclair property and uh, lesser work on both the Penn and Doric properties. Great, thank you. Well, so to jump right into the discussion, what unique technologies, strategies, or methodologies are you using and what do they mean for the industry? If I can just go in the same order, starting with you, Francis. Um, well, I guess, you know, I think it might be good to just kind of go higher level for a minute and, and just talk about the objective. You know, the objective of what we're trying to do is find new mineral deposits. And what I think is that there's really five data sets that we use, and that would be geochemistry, geophysics, uh, lithology, structure, and alteration. And then when we think about those data sets, when you talk about technology and strategy, it's really about how we collect those data sets and how we interpret those data sets. So thinking about those things, um, there's always new technologies that are coming along about how we collect data and how we interpret it. And so I guess, you know, when you dive down into each of those data sets, that would be, um, I guess, what we're talking about is those technologies. So to answer your question, some of the technologies or, or strategies that we've been using, um, one would be drilling for till. And so typically in, in Canada, you would collect a till sample from surface, but there's vast areas of Canada that have a, a more transported uh, material on top, so glacial lacustrian clay a lot of the time, and you can't get an actual till sample um, within that that surficial unit, so you have to drill down below it. So that would be one strategy, um, and, and the purpose of that is to get a geochemical data set. Um, I'll pass it off to somebody else before I talk for too, too long about that. <laughs> All right, thank you. David, what about you? Yeah, well, glad to pick it up. You know, white gold really only exists because of innovation in exploration technologies. Uh, you know, you look, you know, we're in this district that's, you know, had this prolific history over 100 years, all this gold on the surface. I mean, why was it that, you know, nothing from a modern day exploration, you know, point of view was done there for so long? Like it's in Canada, this, you know, mining exploration is what we do. And the answer is the, terrain environment there is a little bit different. It was actually not glaciated, believe it or not. So unlike how Francis mentioned talking about, you know, the effects of the glaciation, uh, this didn't occur there. And because of that, there's also not a lot of outcrop. So the typical prospecting methodologies that have been deployed across the majority of Canada and many parts of the world just really don't work. So, you know, when, a, when, a, when, when someone's tools don't work, uh, you know, they will avoid that area. So this is where Sean's big breakthrough came. He was there, he had this thesis. He said, okay, well, how can I innovate to improve these methodologies to, you know, to test these theses? And it was through his time there, he was able to innovate and develop a number of different uh, unique approaches to, to be able to evaluate the prospectivity of finding these different mineralized systems. And it started with the soil geochemistry and he was able to tune into different pathfinder elements. Obviously we're searching for gold, but sometimes you have to look for these other pathfinder elements to give you a sense of what that indication is. Um, so a big part of that uh, is, is the reason, you know, that led to all this success and our continued success and, you know, the recent new discoveries we've had. But the other part of it is, you know, the area is, you know, a little bit remote, it is seasonal. So you have to find ways to be able to do things more efficiently and more cost effective. And you know the junior companies in this industry are great for that because they have limited resources, so they are forced to innovate a, a lot of the time. And it's it's through this evolution that we're able to continue to sort of have this success in our industry. So credit to him for, for all these things. You know, are these um, uh, repl replicable? These these technologies, they are. And you know, part of our sort of uh, ethos is to share our innovations with everyone else. You know, we're one player in a district. The more success. Uh, that will happen in our district will lead to more investment in the district. And I think that'll sort of help the industry and you know, the, our local partners as a group. So it's something that we look to do. It's evolved, you know, now, and you know, maybe we'll get into a little bit later, you know, it's become quite a sophisticated uh, methodology, uh, 
term is drones to drills, right? So if you can think from 120 years ago, the prospector and all the pictures with his pan in, in the river in his, in his boots, you know, now that process starts with a drone. Uh, so, so a lot has changed, but it's, uh, you know, it's great to be a uh, part of that. Yeah, we'll absolutely get into that. Thank you. And Neil, what, what technologies and strategies are you using? Well, just to take a slightly step back, we, we took on 300 square kilometers in, in southern Norway. It's an old mining district. Um, several old mines, the oldest started in 1629. Um, operated for 150 euros on and off and there are others there's probably 40 or 50 showings of one type or another on the property there's existing mag and em airborne data from 2004 hasn't really been explored recently it was explored from nickel last in 2004 regionally for copper, it was last regional exploration was 1977. So it's full of airborne mag and EM conductors, way too many to test. And the question is, how do you, how do you sort them out to the better areas? And with a lot of existing data, we, we determined to do a, a two-stage uh, filter on this with the first stage of, of, of gridding and examining and comparing the old data on a, using a, an AI system um, operated by a company called Windfall. And we did that. We had lots of data available to us. And then we narrowed it down, focused it down from 300 to less than three square kilometers. And we then decided to do a geochemical filter on that to see which was the best because our intention is to get to drilling as quickly as possible because drilling is the way you find things. So we, we, in fact, in this case, it's all covered in till and in places it's the stratigraphy is, of the till is reasonably known, but a lot of it is very far transported. So, so we did uh, a, mo a modern method called MMI, mobile metal ion soil sampling, where the metal ions are mobilized vertically from the source. But the source might be in rock, or it might be in the soil. <laughs> so. Um, but we, we narrowed it down to about uh, seven drill targets in five areas and made a start last year. Right, thank you so much. And Brian, what um, technology strategies, mythologies is uh, GFG Resources using? Yeah, thanks, Dasha. You know, I, I think it's important as, as Francis started with was to stand back and think bigger picture and strategy and maybe that, that's best how to understand our philosophy. So. You know, we want to work in belts where obviously we think we can make a relevant discovery and our filter for that is is high endowment belts. Um, big mines probably have big mines around, but no secret there. But most of all, we want to find the deposits that haven't been found yet. So, you know, we're working in areas where we understand there's complex cover, uh, where the cover is quite extensive and where if we look back at history, uh, exploration methodology hasn't done a great job at seeing through that cover and has thus preserved the opportunity. So when we think about our journey with GFG and the Timmins, it's the recognition that 10, 20, 30, 50, 80 meters of till is opportunity. Um, um, and that your philosophy needs to understand how you can succeed with that. So we use a blended approach. Um, you know, we would call it geological structural framework, um, building on a macro scale across the belt. Um, we would look for a very um, good and effective geochemical regional filter. And, and I think that's a good analogy between all of the teams here is that we're using a regional geochemical technique to see through cover. For us, it's, it's, it's till. Um, we're looking either at a combination of um, pit dug till or sonic based till drilling um, to get a, an effective sample over large areas. And, and, and I think with our group, we've been able to screen, you know, hundreds of square kilometers. GFG would hold about 800 square kilometers and boil that down to drill targets. 
And, and really our, our philosophy is more empirical, less model driven, um, very strong regional geochemical filter um, that's able to see through complex cover and, and unravel the history. It still certainly is far from simple. Um, but I think when you look at our uh, success at finding new gold systems, um, which is the first step to finding a new deposit, you know, I think our technology at Timmins is quite effective with that. The other side to our story is with our partners G11 in Wyoming. And this is a good example because there's a, a marginal deposit present there. And it's really about how to make the best value and build value with that deposit. So we've brought in a partner um, in uh, this project, Rattlesnake Hills. They're looking at in situ mining for gold and they have a cyanide replacement technology. And so I think looking for partnerships that can bring new technology and ideas um, to build value for the company is a very strong way. And I think it's something that GFT is an effective way to get a few irons in the fire, uh, all of which are using new technologies. I, I would just jump in there and add, you know, most of Canada is, has been glaciated and it's really, there's only about 1% outcrop in Canada. And so David and, and people working in the Yukon are in a very unique situation where there, it hasn't been glaciated. Um, but so the rest of Canada, 1% outcrop. I think a lot of exploration in Canada has really focused on outcrop in the past. And when you go to places like the Abitibi in Quebec or, or these other known gold districts, pretty much every outcrop has been walked on and sampled. And so we really need to do something differently. And, and like Brian said, you know, we have a very similar kind of strategy where we're using glacial till and, you know, so glacial materials that have been transported in the last glaciation. Um, and trying to use those materials to work backwards to a source and look in areas where people haven't necessarily looked before because they've been focusing on lower hanging fruit, which would be outcropping um, deposits or, or showings. Yeah, so yeah I can comment on that a little bit on our experience in Norway. The, the area we're in has been intensively prospected for probably 400 years and all, all the deposits and showings uh, have been found by prospecting. It's, it's till covered, um, and you have to find a different way. Uh, Playfair probably differs from the other three companies here in that our initial focus, our initial um, filter, if you like, was not geochemical. Our initial filter was AI technology using all available data and then the geochemistry was a secondary filter in, in our case so i'm just wondering if all these methods uh, that you've brought up are primarily for efficacy or is it efficiency or esg reasons Brian? i can start with that yeah. you know i i had to go look at this and i'm like okay let me understand the difference between efficacy and efficiency and and in the end i was <laughs> You know, it's a bit of both for us because obviously if efficacy is is sort of effective and efficiency is how effective is it. So you're kind of answering the same thing. So when I think about our methodology, um, it does really revolve around both those factors. Um, I think the tool we're using, which is ultimately till based exploration with a geological structural framework overlay, um, you know, it. it, it is one of the tools that has a reasonable chance of succeeding in these blind uh, and extensively till covered belts. Uh, I can find something new. Um, you're gonna find the new gold systems. Um, I think any of our, you know, our methodologies would have found, you know, Great Bear 20 years ago, if we could have run uh, a till survey over that, less model driven and, and uh, more empirical. Um, so I really think it's, uh, it is efficacy, it has a strong chance of succeeding in finding something new. Yeah, that's my view of it. All right. Neil? I, I think all of them, in, in our particular case, I don't know if one stands out. They're, they're all important in different ways. Um, in terms of the efficiency, I mean, we were able using AI to reduce our target areas for by 99%, you know, from original 300 square kilometers to something less than three. And 
it, it's kind of a method that uses all available data, which was freely available in Norway. You can download it all and process it and see what you come up with. Uh, again, it's kind of empirical because we we divided the 300 square kilometers into um, 40 meter cells. And we had four, over 400 um, variables calculated, primary or calculated for each cell. But it were, but and then we compared all the results on, on 100 and I don't know 170,000 cells, seven and eight million data points, <laughs> but compared them to known mineral occurrences, good or bad, positive and negative points, and then look for similarities. It, it's kind of a way that geologists work, but uh, I can't keep that much data in my head anyway. I don't know about you guys. But then we went to that with, with geochemistry. But a part of that for us, too, is the ESG part, because in Norway, they really haven't done much mineral exploration for 50 years. They've been concentrating on offshore oil and gas. And it's a rich country. And people are used to going out in uh, parks and just in the mountains to enjoy themselves. So they don't really like other things happening. So you have to appreciate this sensitivity. And so we're doing, you know, low impact kind of exploration. AI, you're not even going on the ground. MMI, you take digging little pits, walking in, digging little pits. We then did drone mag. So all these things are not really impinging on people very much and makes it more ac uh, acceptable. Meanwhile, you're trying to get the message that, yes, think green, but if you want to be green, you're going to need minerals to do it, you know? If you want an electric car, and Norway has the most per capita in the world, um, there are metals in it, and you've got to find the metal somewhere. Um, for our drilling, we're using uh, man portable, and um, again, with uh, with not with low impact on the environment, and uh, it's helping um, with our relations with uh, with local people. So. But all these things are equally important, but in different ways. Right. Absolutely. Maybe David, I'll, I'll jump. Oh, oh sorry. No, I'll, I'll jump in there because it's really going to be a setup for David. Um, <laughs> and uh, so I think, you know, exploration is almost like it's a capital efficiency exercise. And what we're trying to do is collect as much data as possible that's effective um, for as cheaply as possible. And so you know, we're always, as, as technology evolves, there's different data that we can collect, different ways of collecting it, but really that's what it comes down to is how much does it cost and how much data can we get out of it that's effective. And this is the pass off to David because this is something that White Gold and Sean Ryan um, have done extremely well in the Yukon. And it's just amazing to see how much data has been collected up there um, through the multiple passes of exploration that have gone on. Yeah, thanks, Francis. And yeah, Francis is exactly right. And kind of how I mentioned earlier, junior companies uh, have limited resources. And you know, before junior companies exist, it's the prospectors are out there doing it on their own dime to try and come up with uh, you know something with a good enough prospectivity that uh, someone else is willing to invest in it. And uh, you know, that's first and foremost. Obviously, there's other um, reasons to innovate. And I, as Neil mentioned, I think you know most likely it's it's all three of these um, reasons are, are part of why people want to innovate or need to innovate. And uh, as Francis said, you know, that's certainly been, you know, the, the, the genesis of white gold, right? It was Sean up there 20 years ago on his own dime with this theory, trying to figure out how to do things. Uh, and, you know, I'll give you sort of a little bit of example of part of our protocol, uh, you know, how it works and you'll see the innovation and the evolution of the innovation over time and the continuing evolution which is nice about innovation right that there's you know, always something you can do a little bit better 
Um, you know, I mentioned the geochemical sampling and, you know, Sean started doing that on his own and he grew his team and he figured out how to do that efficiently. And, you know, and, and basically at the early days, it was just him, you know, and he tied up all these claims, the majority of which are now in white gold, other than the ones that were, you know, had the big discoveries early on, like uh, the coffee, which Newmont now, now owns. And so we have this million acre land package. Like, how do you go and get a sense of what that could look like? Um, he, he started with, you know, the, the, the geochemical sampling and built up this massive database. I think we have somewhere near 500,000 samples. Uh, it's a true district scale approach where we're, we're looking at the entire region. But from there, you need to start filtering down the prospectivity. Now, you, where you want to go from early stage prospecting and the end goal is your diamond drill, right? That's sort of the real truth teller in our business. Uh, and how do you get there as efficiently, effectively, and, you know, being as sensitive to the environment as, as, you, as you possibly can. And, you know, the typical typical protocols are there, but, you know, how can it be done better uh, and how can it be done more cost So, so the, the approach that's been developed by Sean and in use with WIPO, so once you've identified this mineralized system with the soil sampling, you need to start to look at, you know, what does the bedrock look like under that? Um, typically that's done, been done with a lot of trenching, right? It's effective. But it's uh, there's significant disturbance. You know, you're carving up the side of, of, of you know this pristine country. Uh, of course, you know there's reclamation involved, and most people will be good about that. But you know, there's a lot of incidences where that doesn't happen. But we've actually developed an approach which you know avoids all that together, and it's called uh, it's a, it's basically a geo probe. It's called the GT probe, and what that does it it, it basically like a, it's a hammer drill that'll just go deep enough to get into the, the interface or the bedrock. So now you're pulling up what, you know, what is, you know, the size of a pop can versus carving up the size of the company. These things are rubber track mounted. The, the, the disturbance is absolutely minimal. And one other benefit there is it, 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 there's less of a tendency for a very invariability of sampling, right? When you're in a trench and you see one rock versus another, maybe the geo in there might pick up the better one. Uh, that, that, you know, to, to take in a sample bag or something else. This is totally random. You know, whatever comes through the ground comes through the ground. So that's our step of, you know, getting that first indication of what the bedrock might look like. If the results from that continue to show prospectivity, typically the next step would be drilling. Diamond drilling is, is often the case. Of course, this needs to be supported by geophysical type work. That stuff's kind of done either before or during. Uh, a lot of this um, is, is helicopter or fixed wing flown. Uh, we've been able to start to actually integrate drone technology to, to perform some of these. Now, you, you know, you're, you're talking about the carbon um, emission reduction significantly by using a rechargeable drone versus an airplane or a helicopter. So again, something that's you know really resonated well with ourselves from a cost perspective, from an ESG perspective. Um, but before the diamond drilling, this has really been, I think, the big game changer uh, for us and for Sean is we've started to use a track mounted rotary air blast drill. These are much smaller uh, and they're much uh, less expensive than diamond drilling. And in our case, because this is such an underexplored territory, we're really starting to look for indications of mineralization right at surface. So this can let you test the first 100 meters of um, the bedrock very quickly and very um, efficiently. Uh, so, so that, that gives you a great idea of what's there. Now, how can that be improved further? And what's happened in the last two or three years is a couple of things, and this is some you know, really great technology. There's a tool called an XRF gun, and that'll give you an indication of what the mineralization is on a real-time basis in the field. So when you have a short season like we do in the Yukon, you know, normally you have to send some stuff back to the lab. Who knows how long that's going to take? In the last couple of years, I think we've all experienced tremendously long lab processing time. Well, now at least we have an indication of what's there. Now, for certain minerals, it works better than others. It's not the greatest for gold, but it, but for example, on the Uli Ridge drilling we did this year, we know that there's a high correlation with arsenic. So if we're getting great arsenic numbers in this um, samples, you know, that's gonna give us confidence to continue to drill in that area and chase down this arsenic versus having to wait two or three months and maybe run out of time for the end of the season. So that's been a, a great, and once you're there, once you're set up, that investment's been made. So the more, the more work you can do while you're there, Obviously, from a cost perspective, that's uh, ideal. And another thing that Sean's been able to implement, which has been you know, even more, I think, of a game changer, is the criticism with rab drilling is you don't get core. 
so you know the geologists need to see the core to see the structural orientation but what they've been able to do is use a downhole optical televiewer so basically you don't get the you don't get the core itself you're able to drop this camera into the hole and you get a picture of what the outside of the hole looks like that gets fed you know real-time basis through wi-fi and the satellites you know back to the geos in the camp and by the next morning they can get an interpretation of what that looks like so we're able to harness a tremendous amount of data in a very short period of time to advance these targets a lot more quickly than we've historically been able to. And obviously, if you're checking all the boxes through that process, the last step is to bring in the diamond drills. Right. So. Thank you. Yeah, I think most of you have actually answered my next question, which was, you know, how effective is this and what have the results been so far? But I'm wondering what upcoming catalysts might prove your case for each of your respective companies. Uh, Francis, you want to start? Um, I guess so for results, I didn't really talk about this much, but we, Kenorla made a new gold discovery with our partner Sumitomo at our FROTEP project. And this was a completely green fields program where we went from regional till geochemistry down to a drill target within uh, two passes of exploration. And we hit 29 meters at eight and a half grams gold on the first drill program. And now we've defined uh, multiple structures with you know, excellent mineable grades. And, and so it's, you know, been an exploration success. And I guess the, the approaches is what we've been talking about is using till geochemistry or, or glacial materials and tracing backwards to where they came from. Um, so that would be the results. And then in terms of the catalysts, I guess, you know, we have a number of other programs where we've been using till geochemistry and we have an upcoming drill program at our Shikabee project, which will start in March. And that is after about two and a half years of doing drill for till programs using a sonic drill rig. Uh, and then we have a number of other greenfield programs that are that are working up to drill target this summer um, using the same approach that we used at our ProTep pro project to make this new discovery. Great, thank you. Brian, what about you? Yeah, with CFT, um, we've got a couple irons in the fire. Uh, I think probably the most relevant catalyst is, is our results from Montclair where we acquired a property last October. You, you know, it does have a little more advanced area in terms of some of the historic work. So we're able to you know, data mine 40s and 60s vintage work and and put together a, a drill program pretty quickly. And we executed in that Q4. And just last week, we announced uh, an intercept that was about 4.8 grams over 25 meters. So, you know, I think a pretty solid intercept. And uh, we have a number of assays and, and holes that are pending around that and further exploration planned uh, for the Timmins area. Um, if we looked at some of the more greenfield work around there, or even on the Penn property, we'll do a more uh, sonic work this year. And ultimately, in some cases, this is iterative where you realize your methodology is works on about 80% or 70% of the area, which is what I would say ours did historically. And now we're looking at a smaller chunk where we would go back and do uh, sonic on a small piece. We're doing that on pen. The other piece of catalyst for us is with our partners at G11 down in the US now. Ultimately, when you're trying to bring a completely new metallurgical and mining process to an industry, it's no uh, small step. And what they're trying to do is bring in CG mining to gold. And uh, the initial metallurgical test results from Rattlesnake Hills should come to market here in the next few weeks. Uh, it's been a long wait, but uh, I'm optimistic we're getting close to publishing those. And that's really going to tell us, um, you know, if we've uh, got a chance with this new technology at dissolving gold and uh, looking at in situ mining from a gold perspective. So those would be our, our key catalyst drill results from uh, Montclair and our G11 results from Rattlesnake Hills. Great, thank you. Um, Neil, what about you? Any upcoming catalysts? Yeah, we'll be back drilling in Norway shortly. Um, might be a couple of months, but um, we just started last fall, but with, we, we experienced lots of delays, mainly because of COVID, difficulty of getting people moved around the world and equipment moved around the world uh, slowed us down considerably. We didn't actually start drilling until the end of September and managed to do about a month. And we'll just pick up that program and be back at, be back at that uh, as soon as we can. Uh, ultimately, the catalyst is you hit something in your drilling, you know, the truth machine, as people like to call it. And um, that's the ultimate thing. The 
The other thing that we are doing is looking for other areas where we can apply the same technology. We have identified one and made some applications for exploration rights and uh, we're continuing that search. So we'll, we'll see where that takes us. Wonderful. And David, um, upcoming catalysts that prove your case. Yeah, we, we were actually been very fortunate uh, over the last couple of seasons. These techniques have been really successful. Uh, last year, we actually had two major brand new discoveries. Um, probably the one that got the most press was on our Betty property. This is contiguous to a Newmont's gold deposit. It's also uh, just north of the casino uh, deposit, the large copper gold porphyry that Western Copper owns. It's on a target called our Betty property. This is our first ever diamond drill. So we've gone through this whole protocol that I mentioned. And, you know, we were able to uh, have some incredible results. The highlight hole was um, 50 meters of three and a half grams. So we will certainly, you know, be going back there to do a lot more work. Uh, what's even more exciting about that area is, you know, it sits right on the same fault system that holds, holds that copy deposit. We have six other targets that we've identified through the soil sampling and then the drones to drill protocol that will be on deck to do some more work this year. Uh, we were able to you know, get fully financed uh, after announcing those results. Our partner, Nico Ego, it's topped up to 19.9%. So uh, keen to get back out there and start working on that. Uh, we also had another uh, discovery on our Yulee's Ridge target. This is just a couple kilometers west of our flagship Golden Saddle deposit. Uh, we uh, just announced that last week, actually, where we have about 20 meters of seven grams. So, uh, you know, very high grade, near surface, brand new discovery. This target is actually contiguous to one of our other targets called the Ryan Surprise, where we've done quite a bit of work over the last couple of years uh, with the goal of uh, trying to increase our total resource base. Um, you know, we're at about 1.8 million ounces now across all the categories. And as opposed to just trying to delineate our, our flagship deposits, you know, to sort of systematically grow them, as a junior, you know, we feel we get our best bang for our buck and return on our investor dollars by going out to find new zones of mineralization uh, in a, and especially in a close proximity to deposits, the best place to find that. So great success there. Uh, very keen to, to follow that up. And, you know, we think that they made them connect together. So that that's exciting to do. And in the background, you know, we are continually working up this uh, early stage protocol on the balance of our, our big portfolio to bring up new targets that hopefully have even more discoveries. So lots going on. We're very Great. excited. Yep, sounds like it. There are so many attendee questions, and I want to make sure that we can address as many as possible. But I just have one uh, last question. Um, do you think that the mining industry is slow to innovate? Um, why or why not? I'll start with uh, Neil, perhaps. Uh, yes and no. <laughs> I think as there, there are two things about it. Um, People say, well, we're finding things. And if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And there's certainly a number of people in the industry who will have that, who do have that mindset. And anything new uh, is considered unproven and therefore extra risky. And people feel that exploration is risky enough already without doing new untried things and there's certainly a whole bunch of people who feel that way uh, whether they're involved in mining in the exploration industry or or as directly or or as investors you know who who feel that way there's a there's a definite group of people who feel like that and you explain something new to them and they say well show me you know and but I, I think people are working in the industry um, and we've heard lots of it today look at an area and say look this area has been worked extensively for years for on the every every piece of rock that is visible people have looked at multiple times um, in, in Playfest case you know it's been prospected for 400 years and, and there are tens of kilometers of EM conductors and mag features. Um, where do you start? 
you, you have to do if you want to make a new discovery in an area that you know is a favorable area because there are existing mines, you have to do something new. And I think most people in exploration are much more open-minded to trying new things. Great. Uh, David, what do you think? Yeah, I, I agree with Neil. I think that, uh, you know, in the last little while, though, there's probably been an accelerated advancement. Now, you know, that's part of that is just the general acceleration in technology we've seen across every industry. You know, a lot of that's being worked into, uh, you know, the existing operations, but we're also being forced to do it to some degree as well, which is not a, a proponent of it, but, you know, people may not, otherwise not want it to, they have to, right? You know, I think in these tier one jurisdictions where like Canada or the US or you know, Norway or Europe, where, you know, there's great places you want to be operating. There's stable economies. There's, uh, you know, well-known legislative uh, protocols for being able to advance. If you want to work there, and a lot of these times, the, you know, the lowest hanging fruit has been found, you got to figure out ways to be able to do it better, right? I think that's uh, part of it. And, 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 and so you're forced to sort of do that if you want to be competitive in that environment. And there's just a lot more out there uh, that, that in terms of opportunity, you, you know, now you're starting to see modular nuclear reactors. Well, you know, that could be game changers. There's a lot of big deposits that may not be in the greatest place from an accessibility. You got to bring energy there. Uh, but you put a small nuclear reactor there, that can be a, you know, a game changer altogether. Uh, so I, I think it's picking up. And I think the market is starting to demand a little bit more which is is good too and that'll push things a little bit further right and, and and you know again you know people big companies will do things either because they want to or because they think you know they'll be rewarded uh for different reasons and hopefully it's for, it's for the, the the former and from an altruistic perspective but now we're seeing uh you know personless electric uh, vehicles being used in mining for example right that's the benefit you know it's safer you know you reduces carbon footprint, et cetera. Uh, so, so there's a lot more happening. I see, you know, I'll say in the last five or six years, and I saw maybe a lot five or six years before that. Brian, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think innovation is, and, and uh, this path within the exploration landscape has moved significantly in the last 10 years. Um, I, I do see that it's being led in two fronts. And, and I think this panel is a good example of the smaller groups and, and juniors that are trying to lead innovation in the exploration space. And you have some really strong candidates here that are being technical successes and, and I do think can find new minds. And the other aspect of uh, innovation is the major. So we partnered with Newcrest on Rattlesnake Hills, and we have a very strong relationship with Newcrest and obviously lots of dialogue with Newmont and the barracks of the world too. So I do think that that's the other side of the pendulum in terms of innovation is what the majors are doing. Uh, we don't always see or hear, or the public doesn't always see or hear what, what those groups are doing. They don't, it's not necessarily in their interest to disclose what they're doing from an innovation perspective. But I see this as two groups that are really pushing the innovation space. Um, and, you know, I personally feel that, you know, discovery trends have dropped so materially that you really do have to innovate if you want to find the new relevant systems out there in these world uh, today. Um, I think teams here uh, have a very, very strong chance of finding world-class deposits um, by applying some of the innovation that's taken place. And I know you're uh, looking through some of the questions on machine learning and how to work through these data sets is one of the key pieces um, in terms of interrogating the massive amounts of data that we all generate. And I think that that's an aspect that we all use variably and to an extent in our targeting. Um, so that is, is such an important piece. And I know that the majors are really driving that aspect of it all, even in a camp like Timmins, uh, where machine learning is understanding relationships and how gold forms and why it is and where it is. Um, in a, in a hundred year old camp like Timmins. So uh, I'm quite uh, impressed with the degree of innovation within the space. I don't think we always see it. Um, and I do think it's very much a necessity. All right, Francis, your thoughts? I would agree with Brian on the point that we don't always see it. And I think there's a couple of things to think about in terms of innovation in the mining industry. Um, is it junior exploration's place to drive innovation in the mining industry? I'm not sure it is. I think it's our job to use the technologies that have been developed and, and brought to market by others and use them as effectively and efficiently as possible. Um, and like Brian said, 
you know, the majors are developing new technologies um, behind the scenes, and eventually those come to us in, in the junior market. Um, and not just the majors, but also research institutes as well. And, and one example is because David brought up the use of XRF uh, would be a technology that's been spun out of CSIRO in Australia, which is called Portable PPB, and they're doing, they've developed a methodology to analyze for gold and XRF. Um, so that's not necessarily the place of a junior exploration company to be developing those technologies, but it's definitely our place to be utilizing those technologies and really keeping up with the curve um, and understanding what's out there and, and how we can use it in our exploration programs. I would add one other thing, and I, I probably could have talked about it with my segment, was the industry um, research partnerships and that role of, of understanding the bigger picture architecture controls that we all seek to understand to target. And uh, in the landscape we play in, which is Timmins, Merck, uh, and the Laurentian University are playing an extremely strong role in understanding that bigger picture architecture of what are the structures of controlling gold? How are they reflected in the deeper crust and how does it translate to mine? So this innovation can be a technology, it can be through AI, it can be through partnerships at the University of understanding the really big picture controls of our mineral systems. So I think that's another piece of innovation that's key to our success. And I, I would tack on to that as well. Um, I think, so Brian was talking about Merck and Laurentian, and that was through a, a research program called Metal Earth. And there was about $100 million that was spent on fundamental geologic research in the Canadian Shield. And I think one of the most amazing things that came out of that was the magneto telluric surveys that were done. And it basically shows that every gold controlling structure in the Canadian Shield is a major conductor down to 10 kilometers depth. and. Canorlan was one of the participants in that program. We ran a MT line over our Shikabee project. And what came out of it was that this is a major conductor similar to the other major gold controlling structures in the Abitibi. All right, thank you so much. There's so many questions here. So I'm gonna to try to jump right into some of these attendee questions. Our first one is from Stephen. What, and then I'm, feel free anyone to jump in, um, whoever has an answer, not everyone has to, but, um, what is your experience with AI in generating exploration targets? Um, it seems that AI is a good is good at generating exploration targets where there is existing data, but not when there is a lack of data. Well, I can jump into this. It, if you don't have the data, you can't use AI. <laughs> it's as simple as that. So I, if you don't have existing data, you have to generate your own data. Really AI, as far as I can see, it is, is largely an exercise in data processing of data, either that already exists or that you yourself have, have generated and using it in, in some way to, to filter uh, that data to generate targets, drill targets, because ultimately you need drill targets. And that's the only the way you're going to find things, particularly in areas which which have been explored for many years. I'll I'll jump in and add a little to that. You know, so when when Kenorland started in 2016, the first thing that we started out doing was running a prospectivity model of the Abitibi, and and this would be, I guess, what people are calling machine learning today. But it's really a GIS exercise where you are looking at attributes of different data sets and overlaying them on each other. And this has been something that's been done since I think 1994 and all of the major mining companies have been doing it since the early 2000s. So it's not necessarily something new. Um, but what I find useful about that is that I, we, we've used it as another data set and it's not the, you know, the be all end all, but it's an effective way of looking at multiple data sets at the same time and making a nice, you know, beautiful heat map. And you go, you look at the hot colors and it's like, okay, maybe we should look there a bit more. Um, but the limitation is that these models are really dependent on the data that goes into it. And so I think the scale of data is very important. And when you have multiple um, data rich areas, and then you pair that with other areas where there's not much data, the models are 
fundamentally fundamentally wrong most of the time. And so you really have to look at what's going in the, into the model um, before I think you put too much weight on it. Um, Hans asking, would machine learning help to analyze and group more drill core data? And have you used automated core logger? I haven't. <laughs> I can, I can, I guess I can answer this a little bit in terms of some of our experience with automated core logging, run true scan and core scan uh, with the, our partners down in the U.S. Uh, in Creston, you know, very useful for, you know, holistically summarizing some of the alteration indices as you went through and creating a 3D model for your alteration. So some of that can be uh, very, very useful and the automation of it in terms of moving it to directly coming out of the rig is probably a, a very uh, relevant new technology in terms of real-time data. Um, you know, I do think it, it, it still comes back down to your geologist has got to look at the data and look at the, the picks and the output and make his impression to them. So it still comes back down to the geologist looking at the output of the AI and, and saying, okay, what do I think of this and where do we want to go with this as the next step? Um, so yes, very, very relevant. Um, and I think it's just another way to build another layer to make our geologists more effective and, and efficient at getting to that drill target stage. And when we do get to the drill target stage, how do we make the most of it? Thank you. Um, Stephen's asking, she's saying, many major mining companies are sitting on some of the best land packages available, but haven't completed any significant exploration on them um, in a while. What can we do in the mineral exploration industry to see more exploration on these land packages? Do juniors need to approach the major companies or should the major mining companies be reaching out to the juniors? That's a good question. I can touch on that to some degree. In our case, um, we actually approached the major. Uh, we, when White Gold was first formed in 2016, uh, you know, we had Sean Ryan had tied up this you know, incredible package in the White Gold District and the other two uh, large landholder, one was Gold Corp at the time, which was then bought by Newmont, and the other one was Kinross, who had the deposit, the, the gold and saddle deposit, and you know the other properties that were owned by Underworld Resource, which it had acquired in 2010. And we approached them with that exact um, offer. It was that like you know they you know, big company, they did sort of just bought Redback, there's a lot of their attention was focused there. And, and you know, our pitch to them was, listen, you know, we're here, uh, our team has been doing this for over a decade, it's actually, most of the, the people who made that original discovery were now working with White Gold. And uh, we asked them, you said, look, like, do you guys like this district? And they said, absolutely. Uh, do you like our properties? Absolutely. So what we ended up doing was they, they rolled their properties into White Gold for uh, equity stake in the company to allow basically, you know, the guys that knew the, the area the best to continue to work on it and help, you know, build their, their, uh, the value of those properties for them. And I think it's a good idea. I think that the, knowing the way big companies operate, the owners would more likely than not have to be on the junior to go, you know, make a proposal to the major uh, for something like that. And you know, there's lots of ways you can do it. Obviously, you know, Ours is one example, but it could be joint ventures, it can be option agreements, et cetera. And it's a really great idea for, you know, these major companies to be able to advance some of these assets. You know, what the one reality is, and I think maybe Brian touched on it earlier, there's been a terrible underinvestment in exploration in the last decade. Right? And we're sort of have a little bit of a cliff coming ahead of us, and especially some of these critical elements that we're going to need to take, you know, global development to the next level, especially if we want to embark upon this greener economy. And a lot of work needs to be done. And it's companies like the people sitting on this panel here today that do that. And without the, and, and you're starting to get a flavor of, you know, how difficult it is and what it takes to, to be able to make a successful economic discovery. So, uh, you know, any idea that can help uh, accelerate that process is a good one. And, you know, and, and that is an example of, you know, one way to accelerate new discoveries on these packages that are maybe just otherwise sitting idle is not getting the attention they deserve because of limited resources. You know, big companies have so many people also. Thank you. It, it's not always easy to to get um, major mining companies to part with their pet projects, even if they're not 
high on their list anymore. Um, when I worked for a major, one of the things someone said to me, they compared it with a kid with a new toy. They get the new toy and they play with it all the time and they, they're doing lots of work, i.e. lots of exploration on their wonderful new project. And then eventually it kind of fizzles out or is replaced by the new latest and greatest. And the kid throws the toy over in the corner where it sits and gathers dust and never gets any work done, never gets anything done, doesn't get played with, doesn't get picked up. And it's sitting over there. And it's fine, but let another kid come in and try and pick it up and play with it. Then there's a big reaction, you know? Get off my toy. And it, it's a little bit the same thing sometimes with, with majors and uh, property and projects, you know? They, they may not be working on it, but they, they want to keep it just in case. I, I would say that I kind of think that the majors have relinquished a lot of ground in the last while and that they're really going to the juniors um, for these kind of exploration ideas. And at least in Canada, I would say that, you know, there's some places, let's say in Nevada, where it's, you know, you have patented claims that you can sit on forever. Um, and in that case, I would agree. But in Canada, where you have to keep spending money in order to uh, hold the ground and keep it in good standing, I think the majors have kind of relinquished a lot of that and they they come to companies like us um, for these kind of exploration ideas yeah I think it's uh, you know your relationship with that group and GFG um, certainly spends a lot of time trying to work on the corporate development side with the majors and you know understanding we need to show them that we can do something as effectively or better than they can and that we're gonna um, ultimately do something and make a discovery that will benefit both parties so this comes down to the nature of the deal and then the relationship and trust between the two parties. Um, so I, I think there's been some relinquishing of ground. I think it's uh, still a, a, a continuity where there's probably much more opportunity to do that. And as you see more consolidation within the majors and the mid tiers, this will um, continue to be an opportunity to find some of these tracks of ground, whether, you know, something like the new Igneco, which is, you know, an amalgamation of so many different um, historic companies that now comes under one huge umbrella and what becomes relevant to them. So I constantly look at opportunities to, uh, to, to partner with groups um, that have tenements that we think are underexplored. Thank you. Uh, there's a lot of forward looking questions. Uh, we have one 100 years from now, will exploration data storage be an issue when machine learning is standardized for data capture via very high resolution images? I think 100 years from now, things are going to look very different. <laughs> and, and we're not really going to know what that's going to look like. But one thing I've been thinking about is, is the oil and gas industry and how core logging goes in that space. And geologists in the oil and gas industry don't do anything until they have they have a well log and i think as we go forward mineral exploration and let's say hard rock geology will become a lot more standardized where there'll be a lot more analytical data and i think you know we're really seeing that in the last 10 years uh where you know things like xrf are coming along we are routinely doing let's say four acid icpms um downhole to get uh, a complete data set. And like like David was talking about the televiewer, you know, and, and when you start putting all these things together, I think that core logging and mineral exploration will probably look different than it does. Uh, it, it'll look different in 10 years than it does right now. Yeah, I agree, I don't think you need to look out 100 years to see what the demands are gonna be in terms of, uh, data and store, uh, storage of data. Uh, you know, the amount, of, I think just generally the amount of data for storage is uh, increasing at, you know, exponential rates and more, you know, like it never has before. And obviously that's why your Amazon and your cloud businesses are doing so well, and that's going to continue. And, you know, that's going to favor um, AI and, and the uh, utilization of these newer technologies, which is great. Um, so it's, it's certainly a part of it. And, yeah, 100 years is a long time when we think of 5, 10, 20 of, you know, how long 
you know, some of us have been in the business and, um, you know, I saw an interesting technology that I think is really relevant uh, a couple months back. And, you know, we so archaically still drill diamond drill holes and the cost per meter is astounding. Um, you know, and, and it is one of our biggest challenges in this industry. And I saw somebody that's wanted to use a laser to drill a hole and the productivity was a hundred fold over drilling with the diamond drill hole. And so when we think about where our industry goes, yeah, it will be more data dense for sure. No question about that. AI will play a bigger role. The geologist will have much more data in hand and hopefully we can get through one of these hurdles, which is an, an anchor to us, which is still diamond drilling at, you know, 50 meters a day, how can we turn that into 200, 300, 400, 500 meters a day to actually get better efficiencies? So I I think those step changes in our technologies will come, maybe not five or 10, but I don't think they're actually 20, 40, 50. I do think they are in this sort of near to medium term. um, And that will very much revolutionize the space. And you will see the majors push um, on that kind of new technology, because it could be very revolutionary to the efficiency of exploration. All right. Well, so that is all the time we have for today. There's still a lot of questions. So what I will do is make sure that I email all the speakers your questions, and I'm sure they'll be happy to answer you directly. Um, I also think this probably calls for a part two, since it was such a great discussion. So thank you so much to uh, Brian, Neil, David, Francis for joining me today and for all your incredible insight. And thank you for everyone who attended and asked all your great questions. Um, as a reminder, this was um, recorded and will be available to watch afterwards on six.com. And if you're interested in any of the companies presented today, feel free to reach out to them directly. And there's, of course, more information on their website. Mm-hmm.